One of the things that uh, grabbed me most about Nietzsche originally was his delineation between the individual and the herd, the true individual. Some people would say that that's a, the superman, um, or at least the overman, because uber, uber, I guess, can be translated both ways. Um, and Nietzsche says, step outside of the herd, don't try and pigeonhole yourself, don't try and shoehorn yourself, is more like it, into the herd. Don't try and force feed yourself society's values because it's not going to work. That their values are, in many ways, toxic to you. Uh, if you are not of the herd, um, and I find that a lot of the misanthropic philosophers that I've dealt with seem to, biased opinion, seem to lack the courage to. perhaps due to the democratic spirit of our age or um, perhaps an excess of loyalty to utilitarianism or something like this. And, and I shouldn't say excess of loyalty to utilitarianism in terms of utilitarianism. What I mean is uh, a utilitarianism that ends up being toxic to someone who is of a particularly individualistic bent that simply does not or is incapable of accepting society's values. Um, it's the, who is incapable of believing in that which seems to motivate the herd. In our case, it would be consumer capitalism and I guess what Baudrillard would call hyper-reality, this reality that is created now by things like the Internet and the mass media and that kind of thing, uh, advertising or whatever, politics even the hyper-reality that has replaced reality in most people's minds. Um, <clears throat> reality TV becomes more real than reality. Um, a lot of people look at things like that, the herd mentality or the hyper-reality or the mythologies that underpin our society, and it seems so all-encompassing and so massive a thing, an it, that they're almost horrified by it. Whereas... Nietzsche just says, let those shackles fall to the ground and walk away. Um, that's the way I read Nietzsche, because, well, of course, we all read into philosophers that which we already believe. I don't really believe myself to be part of the herd, but very few people do, I suppose. <laughs> uh, one of the tricky things about you know, the postmodern hyper-reality, herd mentality, is that it sells itself as the anti-herd. You know, this obey thing that says, you know, obey, which hints that, really, it, it means rebel, but because it's mass-produced, it ultimately does mean exactly what it says. Um, <sighs> Safi seems to fall into the same trap, where he says, if you see reality for what it is, you will be driven insane because it's so different from what you thought it was. Um... Choran seems to think that it's so overwhelmingly all embracive this Borg-like reality that's crushing actual reality, that um, there doesn't seem to be any escape other than saying, pardon my English, fuck life. <laughs> you know, there's, there's nothing beyond that. Uh, the hyper-reality that has taken over our thinking, which in my reading of history, actually, has always been present. It just, it's just in different forms. But they look at that and they say that our society has gone so crazy with replacing reality with this mythology that there's really no way out. And reality itself has become so polluted with this false, um, false reality that there's nothing really to do but use all your strength and willpower or whatever to separate yourself from it and not get over uh, overwhelmed by it. Um, again, I read Nietzsche saying, we're free, you know, like, it's, it's, it's as though a large boil has been lanced as opposed to discovering something horrifying. Um, 
I always say, you know, Plato's cave, if the prisoner is wrenched out of the cave and tossed out into the sunlight, he may go insane. He may also roll around in the sand going, I can't believe I'm finally out of that hell hole down there. Um, maybe in some sense he was a prisoner who understood that he was in a prison, you know. Um, the other prisoners down there didn't know this is the only reality they've ever known. But maybe the prisoner who was tossed out of the cave was bloody glad he was tossed out, finally, after all this time. Um, and this is why I read Charon, unfortunately, with... He resonates to, with me in not, I won't say an optimistic way, but in an affirming kind of way, which maybe this is the way he meant to be understood. I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, but uh, I've got a passage here that uh, is uh, called Stages of Pride. Um, about what happens when you, or my interpretation is, when you come across this epiphany, when you come across this idea that hyper-reality or the herd mentality or the mythology of our society or whatever um, can be identified as not real. No matter how big it is, no matter how overwhelming it is, it's still not real when you understand, when you see things clearly, um, what inevitably seems to happen. Stages of pride. Frequenting, frequenting the saint's madness, you happen to forget your limits, your chains, your burdens, and you exclaim, I am the soul of the world. I color the universe with my flames. There will be no night from now on. I have prepared the eternal banquet of the stars, the sun is superfluous, everything shines, and the stones are lighter than angels' wings. You know, you've discovered the truth. You see things. Then between frenzy and contemplation, if I am not this soul, at least I aspire to it. <laughs> Second thoughts. Have I not given my name to all things? Every object proclaims me from the dung heaps to the vaults of heaven. I am not the silence. Uh, am I not the silence and the din of things? Pride. I've discovered truth, and I'm a blessed being. I'm one of the lucky ones. I'm one of the saints. <laughs> um, that too has its pratfalls. And at the lowest, the intoxication past, the disillusionment. I am the grave of sparks, the worm's mockery, a carrion importuning heaven, a carnival parody of the beyond, a ci devant nothing without even the privilege of ever having rotted. What perfection of the abyss have I come to that there is no space left for me to fall in. The prisoner has gone back down into the cave, attempted to explain to the other prisoners what he has seen and how wonderful it is. And they think he's a complete madman, an idiot, or whatever. <clears throat> he's been... He's suddenly seen reality in a flash of insight. Nobody gets it. <laughs> uh horrific disillusionment. I like the story of um, The Greatest Temptation of the Buddha by Mara, where Mara, the god of the underworld, says to the Buddha, before the Buddha goes out to proclaim his liberating message, your message is correct, actually. But it is so mind-blowing, so um, different from the way most people think, or the way everybody else thinks, <laughs> um, that how could you possibly explain this to anybody? Most people, how many people will understand what you have to say about being the Buddha, being awake to what reality actually is? Uh, that was his sorest temptation, and the Buddha overcame it by saying, some people will understand. <laughs> um, in other words, he decided to be modest in his goals, allegedly. Uh, you know, the old thing about, it matters to this starfish. Um... Choran seems to say that the herd mentality is a pathological state for everybody involved in it. And even if you transcend it, you end up snaring yourself with things like pride or disillusionment when you try to spread your idea of how wonderful it is to actually see reality for what it is. Um, there's another way. As I say, there's Nietzsche... Um, or there are, you know, any number of 
um, examples of people who go, whoa, now I get it, now I see reality, you know, a lot more clearly than I did before, and I would just rather keep that knowledge to myself and sort of exist in society, but I'm in it but not of it type thing. That's kind of what resonates with me. Um, it's like I'm walking around in the matrix and I'm aware that I'm in the matrix, but all these other people are in the matrix and they're not aware that they're in the matrix. <laughs> um, do I have to worry about the fact that there's still a massive veil over everybody else's eyes? Does that impact me? Um, I'm not sure. Is it a lack of courage or perhaps a lack of interest on that type of philosopher's part that says, what's the point of trying to explain to everybody that the reality that we've constructed is nothing more than a construct? Um, why would it bother you that you can't explain that to other people? What difference does it make at the end of the day? Um, is it arrogant to say, I am not of the herd? Um, strange to say, uh, but I get the impression that Charan, believe it or not, is actually suffering from an excess of humility. <laughs> um, he, uh, rather than just saying that, okay, I've, I've had enough of humanity and um, although I, you know, I have no desire to go out and live on a desert island. He lived in a desert island in the middle of Paris <laughs> type thing. Um, but I don't really, I'm not, I'm not pulled around by the things that pull everybody else around. In our case, consumer capitalism, um, you know, the news, uh, reality TV, all the stuff that seems to motivate our society. Rather than hating it all or seeing it as a horrible empty shell that leaves life meaningless, I would say that you can just sort of say, all right, now I see it for what it is, and it's nothing to do with me. <laughs> um, I have other concerns. I have other things that interest me. What society does is really, at the end of the day, as long as it leaves me alone, and I can negotiate with it to do that, and I don't find that negotiation process very difficult to, to get society to leave you alone, especially in the extremely individualistic English-speaking world. Uh, you can live almost atomistically in, in the English-speaking world, and people will simply ignore you. Um, we, that's, you know, we, we do have a particularly individualistic society. Um, not all societies work that way. Try and live that way, say, in Japan or in Turkey, where individuality is almost frowned upon. Um, I think that Charan actually, so far, and again, I'm just reading a short history of decay here, haven't gone deep into it, so far he struck me as a person who hasn't really explored individuality yet. Um, uh, individuality in terms of just letting those shackles fall. Um, the hyper-reality that seems to be ambrosia for the herd and is toxic for you, um, you can just sort of say, I'm not going to subscribe to that mythology. I'm not going to subscribe to hyper-reality. I'm not going to subscribe to... Safi's massive distractions. I'm not going to subscribe to the idea of the cave as the only reality. I don't need to believe that the Matrix is real. It's not, it's not something that is a requirement in my view of things. Because there's other things, other things that interest me than that which animates and motivates the herd. Um, that kind of begs the question. I mentioned at the beginning that, you know, democratic spirit or utilitarianism or human equality or whatever militates against this. How dare you fundamentally reject society in its entirety and with an arrogance that makes it so cavalier that you would have, that you would reject it like this? That, okay, I 
what society values means nothing to me, but I don't even, I, I couldn't even care less enough about society um, to actually challenge it or try to go out and tell people, see how wonderful things could be. It, it doesn't make a difference to me. Um, and in a sense, trying to convert the herd or to wean it off its mythologies and its hyper-reality is a species of pride and possibly even hubris. Mara had a point when he tempted the Buddha. Why do you want to spread this message? <laughs> uh, why do you want to tell anybody? A lot of Buddhists will say that he wasn't even speaking about the herd. He was speaking about the few other over men out there who will understand. And, you know, the Buddha said, some people will get my message, which means not many. <laughs> um, and some people will think they've gotten it, but they haven't. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think that a lot of the misanthropy deals with this idea that the herd is somehow stupid or deficient for being what it is. Um, I certainly get that so far from... Choran. Um, not even a frustration, I would say a resignation. Saying, what, what can you do with this thing called humanity? You know, like, what, what was to be done? My answer to him is, nothing. Why do you care? <laughs> you know? Um, and maybe he doesn't care. I may be misreading him. But I think that people who have read some of his stuff or, you know, can see that this kind of misanthropy um, can lead to the appearance that uh, the misanthrope hates humanity for being itself. That kind of pessimistic philosophy. Um, humanity is so far gone that there's the humanity is beyond hope of repair. So, <laughs> and let them go on in their illusions. Let them stay in the matrix. If the steak tastes good, <laughs> Why try to take it from them? Well, because it's fake. So? That's nothing to do with you. That they've chosen, in some way, to live in a state of abject falsity. Inauthenticity. Um, who cares? <laughs> if you're pessimistic, <clears throat> the assumption is that you still care. Why do you care when you've lost all hope? That doesn't seem to make sense to me. Hmm.